Hi, welcome to The Upside. I'm your host, Paul Santanello. This is a show where we talk about all the good things that are happening in Longmeadow. Um, with me today, in, and this is um, a second reoccurrence, I didn't realize that he wrote a third book, and, or a second book, we kind of missed it, is with me is Longmeadow resident um, and local author uh, Peter Benton. I know you go by Peter Stephen Benton, so you're not confused with Peter Paul Benton or whatever it is out there, but uh, Peter, welcome back to the show. And um, we're going to talk today, Peter is... Um, and I still, I, I still don't have an idea of how the right brain, left brain thing works with you. And I, I always known you were a little bit different. But you're an accountant by trade, a CPA. And that's the left brain or whatever that side that is. I don't know, because my brain's kind of like in the middle. So I don't know what size there are. But, um, and yet you're an author with these great, this is your third book that you've written. And it's a series of short stories, right? This one is, yes. Yep. So what got you, first of all, let's talk about the, let's, I didn't even know there was a second book. I mean, I, you were probably on my, my, my no-fly list for a while. So. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you know. <laughs> what did I do to you, Paul? I know it was me. I think you torqued the guys off LCTV I off pretty well. I yeah. You drank out of the wrong coffee cup. I think I did, probably. <laughs> so the first book is, and I know they're in front of us and we're going to catch their spines, but the first book, you might see it behind us, is Brownstone and Ivory, and that was a story about, um, a local story that you, a fictional story that you put together with Longmeadow, East Long Metal ties in there. Um, and why don't you tell us a little bit about that? We're going to go through the trilogy that you have here. Well, Brownstone and Ivory trilogy, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose it is. That's never going to come More back like, at you in a good way, Vince. So. No, I suppose not. More like a triple play, I yeah. guess. But, uh, Brownstone and Ivory uh, was a fictional account that I uh, developed based on uh, the history of Long Meadow. I didn't call it Long Meadow, I called it Massasic, which is the Indian name. Uh, which means long grass, and that's what they called this area. And what happened uh, was I, it's kind of a um, Romeo and Juliet sort of a tale. Um, of course, the, the going back in history to the 1890s when the story takes place, there was a West Village and an East Village, and they were very different. And they used to call uh, what is now Route 5 or Long Meadow the street. And on that street were professionals, business owners. It was the wealthy part of town. It really was more affluent. East Village, which became East Long Meadow in 1894 when they divided the town, the state divided the town, and I'll tell you in a second why they did that quickly, uh, was more diverse, was agricultural, stone business, the quarries, yep. the famous brownstone and redstone that it proliferates the, uh, many of the buildings in cities. Um, was a larger area with more people, uh, paid a third of the taxes. The, the, the West Village paid two-thirds of the taxes and um, caused a lot of friction and uh, contentiousness. And they wanted to split the town, and they tried to split the town. And the meetings with the state were quite contentious. And they, they couldn't come to, the East Village and West Village people couldn't come to a, uh, a reasonable conclusion. So the state came in and said, here's where we're dividing it. 1894, July 1st, bang, there you go. Now you have East Long Meadow, now you have Long Meadow still. And as I think I've told you before, that the, the safe in uh, the town hall in East Long Meadow, which was the Long Meadow town hall, uh, still says town of Long Meadow. Right, we want so. it back. So I don't know how we're going to get that one. <laughs> well, but. I don't know. I, maybe a, a truck with a chain. A truck, big chain. Yeah, big truck. So, in, so the story of Brownstone and Ivory is fact fact based. There's some facts in, in intertwined. Histor in historically uh, factual. Yep. Uh, there's several things in there. Uh, I blended a lot of history in there because yep. it was a it was a period of time that was very rich in history. The the Duryea brothers were inventing the first automobile. Um, there was in, and there was the, the of course the gun business in, in, in the Connecticut Valley was was thriving. Uh, it r really um, powered the economy. If you think about the gun business all the way up and down the Connecticut River. You had Smith & Wesson, uh, Savage Arms, you have uh, the Armory, mm -hmm. you had Marlin, Colt, you know, all the way up and down through from New Haven to Springfield was. And, but there's a lot of other history involved there because the 1890s, now half the book takes place here. The second part of the book, the second half of the book takes place in Manhattan. And that, again, in the 1890s was ripe for history and mm -hmm. it was it was fairly easy to build a historical story if you did the research 
on that. And it's, and it's been a very successful book and people like it a lot. So what got you to um, Beyond the Serenade? Beyond the Blue, Blue Ser Serenade, I'm sorry. Well, Beyond the Blue Serenade is a little, you can see that it's a little bit bigger. It's, it, it, it has, it sort of looks like a doorstop, doesn't it? Yeah, larger fonts. <laughs> I always did that for my papers at school, too, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I, when... Because this is the book that I missed, and I really want to apologize for that, because I didn't, well, I didn't okay. realize that, because um, I love hearing this, because I've read Brownstone and Ivory, and I love the fact, that's what I was asking about historically, you know, the, you, you, I get a picture of what's going on between Longmeadow and East Longmeadow and, at the time, and going down to Manhattan, so very... But I, I missed this one. But um. I tend to be very descriptive in my, <coughs> in my writing, and um, uh, that's just that's just my my style, uh, partially. And um, beyond the blue serenade is a little bit darker, and it's a little bit different kind of a story. It is another, um, as brownstone and ivory has been described by a couple of critics. It's um, it's historical fiction with a dominant love story. Well, this is the same thing. Only it takes place in the 70s, the 1970s. Now, people might say, well, that's not really a historical novel. Well, that's 40 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, that's a historical novel. Uh, there were no it's history to our kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you imagine living without a cell phone? Yeah. How about without a remote on your TV? That's what kids were yeah. for, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and we used to have to use telephone booths, you yeah. know? And I don't know what Superman would do today, but, right. uh, you know, he's, he's kind of stuck. He charged with a decent exposure. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he would do today. Probably. But, um, but it's another love story takes place in, uh, for a venue on this story, it's the Hartford area, Hartford, Connecticut okay. area. And it's Hartford, uh, West Hartford, Manchester, um, uh, goes to south um, out as far as uh, also, well, you know, south, it, it also New Britain, yep. out that way. And it's, that's the venue of the story, and it's another love story. And this one's more of a love story, but it tends to take a darker um, path. And when I say darker, if you look at the cover, I don't mean to, to reach. Excuse my boarding house reach. This was kind of symbolic on purpose. You've got the eyes, and over here it's a white pattern that starts to get dark on yep. this side. Well, um, it, it gets into more um, kind of serious issues. Yep. Um, people that uh, have read both those books um, like the books equally, but for but this one, this one is definitely a little bit different. So yeah. you've got a little different twist. Now it looks big. Um, the font is a little bit different. I mean, it's not like it's not twenty point font. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Dick Spot and Jane, yeah. but but the font's a little bit bigger. And and I tend to read classics. And um, I right now I'm reading <laughs> for some reason. Again, Bleak House by uh, by Charles Dickens, and that is basically two stories that are 500 pages long, with little tiny print. And you, he was a very prodigious writer, and and I'm looking at this saying, geez, if you shrunk the the fonts down, that would be a much smaller book, but <laughs> but much harder to read. But yeah. anyway, that's the story with Beyond the Blue Serenade. It's it's a story that people said that they get into, and, and when I wrote this, uh, I wrote it this way. It's got s smaller chapters. There's 60 chapters. There's a prologue, an epilogue, and 60 chapters. And they were written so that you could read it like serially. Okay. It's a serial. And at the beginning of each chapter, uh, there's a song title and an artist from 1978 and before, which kind of identifies what's going on in the chapter. Okay. So it's a little kind of a twist that I put in there with the, okay. with the music. And, uh, and I encourage people in the beginning of the book to listen to those songs before you read the chapter. So I've sort of, sort of combined music with, with writing, which yep. is, I don't know where that part of my brain is, but, uh, but as you say, I, I'm trying to use more than the 25%, I guess, that they say that we use. If you're lucky. But you've, lucky you've accused me of using less than 2%. Yeah, absolutely, so. and you've gotten by pretty well on it so far, man, keep going. <laughs> a, so now that brings us to uh, Coming and Going, and this is the third book in the series, and you can see it behind me, it's on a big um, uh, placard here, and it's pretty blurry on the cover. Is that on purpose as well? Well, the people are blurry. Yep. Because the book is, it, it's titled Coming and Going, 
And it's really, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the book is about relationships between men and women. And there's five stories. And everyone is... I can't believe that's not the big one. <laughs> Relationships between wow. men and women, wow. Well, I know, I know. But, well, that was one big long one. Um, coming and Going is five different stories. They're all, they all have a little bit different twist to them. But they all have to do with relationships between men and women and a lot of different kinds of relationships, not just romance. It's, there's other things involved, um, part, kinds, what happens in romance, emotions, uh, things that you, dangling romances that end differently and, and friendships and, 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 and learning to live with, with other people or, or as I describe, uh, the, the first story, um, the, the books, the, the stories in the book uh, kind of, uh, the first one, the first book is, the first story in the book, I'm sorry, I keep calling it a book, uh, is The Village. And that starts out with uh, a married couple at Sturbridge Village. And he runs into, and they run into, he runs into an old flame. And it's somebody that they didn't end their relationship that well. And now he's, now he's very nervous and all of a sudden he's alone with her in a, in a building there in the middle of winter. That's one of the stories. One of them is called Wallpaper. He's always, the, 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 the protagonist is, is married, happily married, but he's always wondered what happened to this flame he had in college. They, they were together for three years, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden he finds himself with her. And I won't go any further than that. Another story in the book is called Novelist, where a, a writer uh, has written a series of detective stories. He doesn't want to write them anymore. And he's arguing with his publicist and his, and his publisher. He doesn't want to write anymore. He wants to write a novel. And they want him to write two more. And, and he's on the, uh, the Queen Mary, too. Um, it's a publicity stunt for his fifth book. And it, it finds himself in the middle of his fifth book book he is in it in it okay so uh, and there and there's some other twists and turns and some other stories there so that's the the blurry people on the cover sort of represents if you'll notice on the cover everything else is clear yep. but the people are blurry that was done on purpose that's kind of symbolic for the fact that we as human beings men and women We've all been in and out of relationships, and we still do. I mean, you know, as we as we grow and as our life changes, and so the relationships and the people kind of get a little blurred as time goes on, yep. and that's really the symbolism right. there. So when you when you you write the book, so when when what's the process? And I know it's not something you say, okay, here's A, B, C, and D, but maybe there is. When you write a book and you come up with brownstone and ivory and and, and these. Uh, and the latest two, and then you go backwards, and you you're figuring out the cover before you. After you've written a book, is that is that what shapes the cover of these books? Is the what's in the book itself? Uh, yeah, okay. because when I'm writing the story, I really the covers the. Uh, I don't know when I come up with the cover. Um, I have a friend of mine who's a professional photographer. Uh, his name's Fred Gaylor. He and I usually, he's the one that does the the heavy lifting on these things but yep. I usually come up with an idea and I bounce it off of Fred we go back and forth and um, we come up with this but uh, this coming and going I sort of had that in the back of my mind we needed a revolving door yep. we looked for revolving doors in New York Hartford and lo and behold the revolving door that we used is in Springfield okay it was good enough it's what we needed um, but as, as far as this cover for uh, Beyond the Blue Serenade, that was something that we worked and worked on. And the, and the eyes on the cover um, are the eyes of, um, because Fred does travels the country and does a lot of uh, photography, those are somebody's eyes in Indiana. <laughs> and he made them blue, mm -hmm. but they're taken out of a crowd. So it's, uh, it's that's how the, we come up. The yeah. first cover, I sort of, uh, uh, after I did the book, uh, I came up with the cover. It's the statue of the, of the, um, of the um, it's in East Long Meadow yep. up on High Street. It's the statue of the stonecutter, or not the stonecutter, the quarryman. 
and that was commissioned by uh, um, by McKnight, and it was done by um, um, Jim McKnight. Jim McKnight commissioned it. Jim lives in East Longmeadow, and it was done by a, a sculptor in in Northampton. Okay. And um, I came up with the idea, and if you'll see recessed in the background, in the sky, is a Steinway piano uh, keyboard. That, I was walking with my oldest son, I was at the Big E, and I took that picture of a piano at the Big E, somewhere in the Big E. I called Steinway, I said, or I contacted them, said, can I use this? And they came back, their marketing department came back and said, by all means. So uh, that's how we came up with that one. Okay. It's just sort of neat. So as far as the covers, um, I have as much fun doing the covers okay. as I do writing the yeah. books. They're very creative. I can imagine. Yeah, you got to have some creativity in there and get your juices flowing. Yeah. As I said, you're an accountant, CPA. Yeah. How do you go from the, the, the numbers, you know, debits and credits and tax law and all that stuff to coming over here and writing stories? What gives you the... What gave you the, um, the impetus to do that or start it? Well, it, it, it wasn't... Because it's not related. That's what I'm saying. I mean, if you wrote a book about, you know, Accountant 101, I could get it. You know, that's your field. Yeah, but, you know, in a way, uh, it, <coughs> in a way it is. And I'll tell you how, that's, how it's okay. related. I was that's always... Why I asked. Well, okay. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I'm going right to the That's question. why it's a TV show, not uh, just a question and answer thing in a paper. <laughs> it's not why we're sitting in a car drinking a beer, right? That's right. <laughs> so anyway, what happened was... Um, and we would never have an open container in a, in a, in a, in a vehicle, by the way. <laughs> Not a moving one. <laughs> well, I don't drink, so there you go. <laughs> but anyway, what happened, uh, you know, it's, um, I've always been a writer. I had, when I was in college, I had a professor who I ran into uh, at the inauguration of Anthony Caprio, uh, Western New England College. I was representing my class. And um, no one else was around. Well, he came up. Well, he came up to me and he said, "What? How many books have you written?" And I said, uh, "Well, er, ah, uh, er, ah." Uh. Yeah. And this was—you you can tell how long ago it was, because Anthony's been there, president for Western New England for a long time. And he said, "You know, you were writing uh, PhD thesis answers in Economics 101 when I had you. You have the ability." So, and, and it dawned on me that I did—I've always, always had that ability. Yeah. And the thing is, you, you wonder about writing. In my occupation, we write tons of letters. We write footnotes for financial statements. We, we, we do, and I've done all kinds of articles, business articles and so forth, that have been published in Business West and all over, and magazines and so forth. So I sort of took a craft that I had and put, mixed it with my imagination and, my, and my, also my, my desire to always create a book, create stories. And there you go. And that's how it happened. Now, as far as uh, the, the biggest problem is finding time to do this, mm -hmm. uh, because this is not all I do. I'm involved in other organizations and boards of directors. And so the time is the hardest part. Yep. The ability, I, I kind of think that I was born with that. And I thank God for my blessings, because I think that was, that is something he gave me that I should have probably jumped on 30 years ago. But um, finding the time to do that now is the biggest is the biggest thing. So wh where do you come up with the ideas? I don't know. You don't know. I don't is know. it just? I mean, when you do now, you have five stories in one book. So yeah. okay, I you know you but they're all somewhat related to. Um, that okay. So now you've just piqued the, yeah. my memory here. Um, some of these stories are were things that actually happened. Okay. That were that were I, I can't say they actually happened because they're fictional, but they were started by an idea of by something that happened. Okay. My wife and I did go to Sturbridge Village, and while we were there, I got the idea for the story, and I remember looking at her and I said, I got an idea, and she looked at me and said, You're crazy. And, I, <laughs> <laughs> and that's which, not the first. Which time, is nothing it? new. <laughs> that's right. So anyway, um, another one is uh, was a story about an old friend that I kind of. It, it sort of happened, and I took it and made it into a fictional story. Um, so those are a couple that happened that way. Uh, other ones were, um, I was, one day I was doing something, and an idea came to my head while I was doing it. Wouldn't this be interesting if this happened? So I guess, and, but, but like Brownstone and Ivory, that just sort of 
I don't know, that just sort of evolved. I don't know where that came from. And beyond the blue serenade, um, I guess you could say that, that some of that um, was triggered by, it does say in the beginning, by actual events. But again, I took something that happened and embellished it and made it into a story. So, not autobiographical, by the way. <laughs> you know, every... No, because you were, I mean, and what, I mean, what I mean by that is that was your time in terms of growing up and, you know, being a young guy in the world and... It's right, serenade, yeah. It was right in my wheelhouse, yeah. if that's what you're talking yeah. about. But um, every story has a piece of me in it. I mean, I'm every character. So when you say autobiographical, um, I would say perhaps yeah. some of it is, and but it's up to you to figure out what piece is. But it's but then you take you take those experiences, and and well you know I'm I'm every character in every book I write. It's the same as every author. Author, they are they are there are pieces of them in every character yeah. because they create the characters. Even if it's based on a true character that they have in their mind, they're making up the words. They're making up the emotions. They're putting them in the situations, you know, and they're plopping them down into the plot, and they're taking a piece of their piece of the storyline, and that's all done by the author. So, yeah. you know. So when you talk to the one thing I heard about, you know, sculpting is that people, the really good sculptors, see the image inside there before they start chiseling and stuff. When you look at your books. How much did you have to take away before you ended up with your product? Oh, Meaning, a lot. Yeah. Um, I get a rough idea of what I want to do for the story. Um, eh, whether I rough it out in an outline or I don't, I usually have to write down the characters because if you're going to have characters coming and going in your book, you have to keep track of them. <laughs> or, or else the editor will say, Joe, who's Joe? <laughs> there was no Joe back here. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden you got Joe here and who's Sally? You know, the editor will rip you up. So anyway, what happens is um, I write the original story and then I go back and I read it and rewrite it and edit it. Probably do that three or four times. You have to. And the story not only, it can grow, it can shrink. Most of the time it grows. Um, and then the day of reckoning. You send your story to the editor. And the editor, now you wait for about three weeks to a month till the editor comes back with your edited manuscript, which not, not only do you get an edited manuscript, you get a whole synopsis of the story, the characters, the plot, you know, the character development, all of that stuff. Your, your, you know, your use of your phraseology, everything about the book. And then your manuscript is chopped up, not chopped up, it's, it's, it's basically grammar corrected, spell check, all that. They go through the thing with a fine tooth comb. But now you've got to see whether or not they like it. What do you have to do to change it? And what corrections do you want to make? You don't have to make all of them. In fact, I probably make 60 to 70% based on what the editor says. Okay. And the rest I sort of say, no, this is what I meant. You know. Have you had uh, little tussles over what no, you never. wanted? No, never. Okay. Never, because, and this, people ask me that. And I'm sure every author gets asked this. Don't you take it personally? Doesn't it bother you? And I say, no, I want the best story I can produce. Yeah. And, and these people are much smarter than I am. They oh. know more about grammar. They know more about uh, punctuation. They, and the, the biggest problem that I have is I grew up using uh, white and strunk grammar. And they use the Chicago uh, style, Chicago Book of Style. And it's different. Um, they're different, and that's mostly used, that is, uh, the Chicago is, is what's used these days. So when I get edited, it's in Chicago, so I have to usually make a lot of changes, but um, I don't take it personally, and I, and I enjoy it, because it's a learning experience, not only for me, but it, well, I don't, I mean, it's a learning experience for me, but it also improves what I've done. Yep. If, if something can be done or said, uh, to improve it. Now also, when you first publish a book, now this went out, and those books went out, and after about a year, I, I get, come back, people come back and say, well, I found errors in the book. Well, which always happens. So I, I let it go out for about six months or a year, and then I take all those errors, errors and I go and correct them. Okay. So you have a second edition. Oh, there you go. Which is cleaned up. 
So for I, one question I have on brownstone and ivory, did the history come first or the story come first and then the history, the historical facts in there? I just, uh, the, the history of the, in that book, really, I love history. So was it si you know, simultaneously or did one come before the other? No, I think it just, I think the story plugged in so great to the, to the history. Yeah. The history was, was, was there was there. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it, like I said, it's Romeo and Juliet. It's uh, uh, rich man, poor man. It's, yep. uh, it's, it's, it's there. And, but I Long Meadow, East Long Meadow. Long Meadow, East Long Meadow. And you know, before 1894, there were no marriages between the two villages. So that didn't oh, wow. help relationships at all. Yeah. Uh, maybe way back there was, but, but in modern time up to 1894, they were two different wow. places, and they had some really. I used for brownstone and ivory. I got to use the uh, the typed up minutes of the uh, meetings they had with the state back in 1890. They have them in the uh, East Long Meadow uh, Library, and then um, the East Long Meadow uh, Historical Commission has them. They were contentious. There were fights. There was arrests. It was all kinds. Of, it was <laughs> wild. Yeah, it was wild. Just like today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what gives you what? What you, you've had three books. You have three books published now. And do these just do these ideas just pop into your head? Like you said, your Sturbridge Village story came to mind. Yeah. Or do you say I'm, I want to do another book and let me just start researching what I want to do? Well, you know, when you first asked that question, I've been asked that question many times, and and every time it, I, I never remember how it happened. Yeah, but but if I think about it, something triggers my memory, and I say, "Oh yeah, I was at Sturbridge Village with my wife. Yeah. That's how that one started. Oh yeah, I was upstairs wallpapering my room, and that's how that one came." And some of the stories in this book, a um, couple of them are like eight years old. I wrote them oh, wow. in while I was okay. writing these other books, and you know, a short a story will come to me, and usually it's a story, uh, it's an idea for a book. But when I start writing it, it's not enough for a book. So it becomes a short story. Okay. And do you develop that? Or do you say, this is just the way it is, that that's what's going to be, and we're going to come out with our coming and going? Well, you know, short stories are also um, a challenge. Okay. It's not like writing a novel. Well, with a novel, you've got a lot more room to do what you want to do. With a short story, you have to really nail it in a short period of time. It's a different kind of a thing. And I really wanted to write a book of short stories. So. I mean. Two novels and a book of short stories, and I got another novel that I'm just You're starting. On? Just yeah. starting. And how long does it take you to go through all this? Uh, well, like you said, one story was eight years old or something like that. But I mean, if you if you sat down and say you're working on one right now, what's the projection? Of, you know, how long are you looking before it's done? The biggie there took about ten years. <coughs> wow. Off and on, off and on. I wrote Brownstone and Ivory in between. I wrote a couple of these short stories in there. Um, I wrote Brown's, Brown, I would say, I would gauge, uh, based on Brownstone and Ivory, a year. Okay. It's a year. From start to finish. Mm -hmm. And then now. it takes another year to really publish it. It takes a while to get it out there. You've got a lot of, there's a lot of time in between. You've got editing, and then you're yep. working on designing the interior, the exterior, and there's a lot, there's a lot goes into it. I'm just, I'm, I, and I really, I'm not saying this because I know you, well, I actually am saying this because I know you of that. I'm just impressed that, you know, someone can, you know, you have an image of someone being a CPA, and that's my image of you. You know, knowing numbers, knowing tax laws, things like that, and now you're writing books, and that, because that just, that takes you and puts you in a whole different direction. Well, I used to play that. hockey, too. So. Yeah, well, <laughs> the banging of the head against the wall might have something to do with Maybe the that was left it. brain, right brain thing, you know, so. It's um, all screwed up. Yeah, yeah, it, that's okay. That's what goes, that's what makes life interesting, that's you know. Um, so. We have about two minutes left in the program. So here's the, here's what I want to do is um, we can't plug this and tell you what you get, buy one, get one free or anything like that because there's against FCC regulations and we probably violated a hundred of them already today. So the question I have is how do people, if they want to purchase these books, how do they go about buying them? We have to, we can't tell them how much they are, I guess, sir, but we can tell them where they can go find them. Well, if you go online and you uh, Google Peter Stephen Benton, it's S-T-E-P-H-E-N, you have to use my middle name. And that's my nom de plume, that's my full name. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. We liked the sound of it when we began. I did. <laughs> um, there's other Peter Bentons out there. Okay. There's other Peter Benton writers, interestingly enough. And, um, but if you Google Peter Stephen Benton, I have, I have a website. There's also plenty of contact points out there. And um, it's available on, or you can, you can find it on Amazon, 
Um, it's in the Kindle. Soon it'll be at Barnes and Noble. It'll be in Nook as well. Yeah. Um, it takes a while for it to populate all these internet booksellers, but it will. But right now, you can find if you want to look at it, look for it. You can see it on Amazon. Okay. And there's a short biography about me, and a, of course, a very handsome picture. Well, it's got to be. You, now we know that's touched up, and that's that's where your photographer comes into play. <laughs> thank absolutely. God you got one. So yeah, absolutely. And you thank know. God for making. That's why I said we're worried, worried about this being in HD. There's no coming back from that one, man. I'm glad you're recording this after Halloween. That's right. I don't want to scare a little. We don't do that, folks. I just want to say thank you for watching. I want to say thank you for Peter for coming in. I I think this is a great story. It's a local a local person. Um, who's an author, and I think these books, uh, like I said, I've read Brownstone and Ivory. Uh, I would suggest that you go to uh, Google, put in Steve, P Peter Stephen Benton, find these books, give them a read, and we'll have Peter back on to talk about these stories again, because I think they're, I love the history that you involve. I really do. I think that's a, a neat thing that you do, because it makes it much more enjoyable to read it, because you can remember things along the way. I, I would add that I think that uh, there's going to be some newspaper coverage, and I'm going to have a launch. Um, locally soon. Excellent. This is the pre-watch. Well, thank you for watching The Upside, and have a great day. And Pete, thanks for coming in. Thank you, Paul. All right. Have a great day, folks.